Four things that I wish I knew before I started doing DMEC surgery. Um, it seems like there are thousands of things that I have learned the hard way, sort of along the way doing DMEC, and I would say increasingly complicated eyes as you gain more confidence. But some of the things that occur to me as having been nice to have known a long time ago include, number one, Patients do not need to lie flat after the surgery. And I think that this is conclusively shown through not only a number of studies which have been indexed on PubMed and published in the top journals, but also basically our own personal experience. When we started doing DMEC, we used to really insist that everyone would lie flat after the operation for 48 hours. We used to keep people supine in the operating room for 90 minutes right after the surgery, afraid that they would get up and dislodge the graft and move the bubble. And we stopped doing that for two reasons. Number one, we had some patients that just absolutely refused to lie flat or they couldn't lie flat or they wouldn't lie flat. And number two, we started doing more and more of our surgeries, not in the hospital or in ASC, but in our office. We have an office-based operating environment. And when we did that, there was just no place for patients to lie flat for an hour or 90 minutes after the surgery. And what we observed is the patients that refused to lie flat or couldn't lie flat, they did just as well after the surgery. And the patients that we operated on in our office who had the surgery and just sat right up and walked off the operating room table did just as well. And in fact, we did a formal study looking at hundreds of eyes with strict postural instructions compared to hundreds of eyes with no supine posturing requirement at all. And what we found is that the no supine patients had fewer detachments than the patients who were strictly posturing. So we figured that out maybe four or five years ago, and we have not had anybody lie flat after DMEC in four or five years. And that has been transformative for our patients because the worst part of the surgery, the thing that the patients hate the most and balk at the hardest is having to lie flat after the surgery. Patients have one eye done and they don't want to have another eye done because they hate lying flat. And since we have eliminated that restriction, it makes the operation so much more comfortable. The complaints are so much lower and pe people are so much more zealous about signing up to have their other eye done. If you want to set yourself apart from other surgeons and patients are thinking, well, who, which cornea specialist should I see? The one who doesn't make them lie flat is an enormous advantage. That's the first thing is that patients don't have to lie flat after DMEC. The second thing that I would have really liked to have known before starting with DMEC is that for reasons that I don't understand, but I think are conclusively shown, patients have a lower detachment rate when operated for indications of bullous keratopathy than for Fuchs dystrophy. And we do in our practice between myself and my father between 20 to 30 DMEX a week. And it is definitely the case that our patients who are operated for Fuchs dystrophy have between a 20 and a 25% rebubble rate. And we are pretty aggressive about, about rebubbling people, but not gratuitous. We don't ever rebubble anybody who doesn't need it. And probably a quarter of our patients operated for Fuchs dystrophy need rebubbling because they have moderate or large detachments or corneal edema, or they're symptomatic and uncomfortable. And what is amazing is that the sicker, more complicated eyes, the eyes with ACIOLs that are post-vitrectomy, that have tube shunts, that have corneal decompensation from prior complicated surgery, these eyes with a bullous keratopathy indication have a much lower detachment rate, maybe 5% in need of rebubble. And that is shocking because these eyes frequently have got little or no air bubble support after the operation. And this is a meaningful thing. I wish I had known this, not just because it's interesting and counterintuitive, but you know, when you start DMEC, you think, well, I'm having enough trouble with the Fuchs eyes. You know, I'm already rebubbling a third of these patients. Do I really want to undertake DMEC surgery in more complicated eyes, eyes with shunts? Am I going to be rebubbling 100% of these eyes? And the answer is no. Shockingly, these eyes have an easier postoperative course and clear faster with less need of reintervention. And I don't know why. 
but it's definitely the case. So if you are not doing these more complicated DMEC eyes because you think you have your hands full as it is with the Fuchs eyes, you may be shocked to see that bullous keratopathy eyes are easier surgeries to do in addition to being more technically, challenged, or technically impressive to other doctors. The third thing that I wish that I had known before starting DMEC is that there are little instrumentation tricks that can make the surgery much easier. Uh, the first relates to decimetorexis. We prefer to do decimetorexis under air, and the reason is that provides, I think, superior visibility compared to balanced salt solution or viscoelastic. And when you are doing that, you can sort of steadily, manually inflate the anterior chamber with a syringe, with a cannula. But that is um, not so easy, actually, and it can be tedious if the chamber is constant, constantly collapsing. Now we use an air pump. When we operate in a hospital, we have that connected to a machine, a vitrectomy machine, which is pumping air into the anterior chamber. When we operate in the office, we use a 60cc syringe connected to an AC maintainer, and then the assistant holds the 60cc syringe and just sort of holds pressure, and that keeps the anterior chamber inflated. That's a really low cost, very effective way to do decimetorexis under air, which provides you with unparalleled visibility so you don't leave remnants behind. It also really reduces your detachment rate not to have remnants there that you can't see as opposed to something floating around in the viscoelastic. The other sort of instrumentation trick is to use something else to make your iridotomy other than a laser or scissors intraoperatively. There are two ways that we like to make the iridotomy. Now, when we're operating in the hospital, we use a 27 gauge vitrector. You can put it all the way out in the periphery, in the angle, sort of overlying where the ciliary body is and make a far peripheral PI. Usually, the bleeding is minimal to non-existent and it really protects you against a pupillary block. And because you can place it so far peripheral compared to what you can see when you use the laser, you can leave a much bigger air bubble in the anterior chamber, which reduces your risk of detachment. Even better than that is we have a, a FACO machine that's made by a Swiss company called Ertli, O-E-R-T-L-I. It has uh, an attachment that fits onto the machine. It's a capsulotomy handpiece, and it's a radio frequency tool that you can use to circumscribe a circular open opening in a capsule. For cataract surgery, you can sort of YouTube videos that really show how easy and quick and simple that is to make your capsulorexis. We don't use it for capsulorexis but we do use it to make an iridotomy. It makes a great iridotomy. And I like it because it makes a very far peripheral iridotomy and it cauterizes as it cuts. So you can make an exquisitely peripheral, big, controlled iridotomy with no bleeding intraoperatively, effortlessly. It takes no time. There's no disposable cost, so it's free. And we really, really think that's probably the best way to make an iridotomy these days. I wish I knew that before we started. And the fourth thing that I wish I knew before I started was the critical importance of graft diameter, graft size. Most people, when they start with DMEC, they use the same size graft for everybody, seven and a half millimeters, eight millimeters. But graft size really matters. It's a neglected variable for a lot of people. The reason is, is that, you know, the highest density of cells is out in the corneal periphery. The cells are more tightly packed. You have more numerous cells in the periphery. So actually, your cell density per square millimeter increases the more of the corneal periphery you use, okay? Besides that, if you just use simple geometry from seventh or eighth grade, you know the pi r squared formula, turns out that you get almost 40% more surface area if you use a 10 millimeter DMAT graft than an 8 millimeter DMAT graft. 40% for those extra 2 millimeters. So people out there are doing DMAT with a 7.5 millimeter graft, and I'm doing a 10 millimeter graft, for instance. I'm transplanting 50% more cells into the patient's eyes. And this can be very, very useful if you're treating an eye with bullous keratopathy. To give it an extra half dose of cells, you really can extend the longevity of these transplants. But there's another reason to use larger or smaller grafts situationally. And that is if you have a hyper deep chamber, 
then you're much more able to unfold the graft if you use a large graft because the graft won't interact with the iris or the lens centrally, but it will in the periphery. If you have a big graft that you jam inside of the eye, you can get great apposition and pinning and control by using the graft and wedging it into the angle. We've got some videos that show that, but that is a huge trick to opening grafts and eyes with deeper, hyper deep chambers to use a large graft. But you also might want to use a small graft in certain circumstances. And that is if you have a super cramped, shallow anterior chamber, flipping the graft over is such a pain if it's inserted upside down or you have to tumble the graft for whatever reason. If you have a bunch of anterior synechia, you make the surgery immensely easier on yourself by using a smaller graft. So what I would say is we tailor our graft size according to the preoperative pentacam measured white to white. And that is adjusted according to whether the eye is a hyper deep chamber or shallow chamber. But by altering the graft diameter, we have, I think, not only has sort of been more effective at providing greater cell densities for our patients operated for things like bullous keratopathy, but also it made the surgery much, much easier to perform in eyes that otherwise have complicated anatomies. So there are a thousand other things that I could talk about, little mistakes that we have learned to sort of stop making, but those are the four biggies that I wish that I had known when starting with DMEC, and hopefully they'll be useful to you.